to another episode, episode five, no less, of Tea with Sam and HG. And I'm joined by the fragrant Samantha, who <laughs> sat there, brew, laughing at my description of her as fragrant. I'm sure she is. So she doesn't strike me as a smelly individual. Does she strike you as being a smelly individual, viewers? Of course not. Probably smells of jasmine or such like, I should imagine. <laughs> I'm sure she'll tell me in due course. But today, fragrances aside, we're going to be talking about the hunter and the hunted. So I'm sat here with a stout brew of Yorkshire tea. And uh, what brew have you got there, Sam? I've got Yorkshire tea. <laughs> Yorkshire tea. There we are. You see, I'm being mirrored already. Yeah. Outrageous. I know. So, hello, Sam. Thank you for joining me. My pleasure. Now, the hunter and the hunted. Now, I, of course, am the hunter. And you, at one point, found yourself as the hunted. Mm -hmm. Did you ever feel like you were being hunted? And, and if so, perhaps you'd care to expand on what that experience was like. Um, I, when I was kind of experiencing narcissistic abuse in its initial um, first time that I, I sort of noticed I was experiencing it, I didn't really realize that I was being hunted at all. I had no clue because mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about narcissism or, or, or any of these dynamics. But now I sort of do notice it when I feel somebody on my tail, as it were. So mm. I do feel it actually more now. I notice it a lot more now. Yes. Yeah. Now, when you found yourself involved, because I know you've had involvement with more than one narcissist. Yeah. Have you ever found yourself subjected to the stare that I've spoken about? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I've experienced that more than more than once. Yeah. And uh, now I really notice it for what it is. I think initially I used to feel like that was a flattering thing to experience that, you know, mm -hmm. someone showing me their attention and that that was something that was almost, you know, um, a tantalizing and enticing thing to sort of be experiencing. But now that makes me very wary and very nervous when I experience that <laughs> from somebody. Tell me a little bit about one of the occasions when that happened. What was it? The step, you know, a, a stare from across the room, or yeah. was that? It was okay. T tell me about what happened. Well, it was when I was um, when I've mentioned before. I used to go to. Um, I was part of a community which was yes. practicing ayahuasca and ceremonies and things like that. So I was experiencing from across the room the person who was the man I ended up in a relationship with, who was the facilitator or the leader of that ceremony, was very much putting his gaze on me, and I could feel it pretty much the whole way through. The first time I was in the room with him like that and I yes. could feel him watching me all the time and um, I felt quite excited by it because I was really attracted to his status within that that group and his the, you know the, the charisma that he seemed to hold and the the regard within which he was held so I found it you know um, very flattering but um, I definitely felt it yeah for sure. And um, when you were experiencing that stare which obviously was in the initial stages of the interaction that you had with him so yeah. it would be within the seduction stage mm -hmm. you talked about how you felt it yeah was it and that you were flattered by it so yeah. presumably the experience was a pleasant one yeah and it was more than pleasant it felt exciting and exhilarating you know it kind of I understand now it was like obviously triggering an addiction within me but it was um, definitely something which I felt and it wasn't just when I could actually see him see him looking at me I, I could feel him looking at me. Yes and when that was happening presumably you would look across to get confirmation of what you were feeling uh, was it the case that he would look away and then no. Flick back. No, he'd maintain he'd maintain his gaze on you, would he? Uh, for for a little bit, yeah. Not not overly, but yeah. I mean, it wasn't like he kind of looked away and pretended he wasn't doing it. He yeah. was letting me know that he was looking at me. I could I could feel it. Okay. And when he looked when he met your gaze, mm -hmm. uh, did he smile or? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There was almost like a sort of knowing knowingness about it. Like a it's just yeah, obviously trying to trying to create a connection. I could okay. definitely feel that. And it felt like I was, um, I guess on some level, I felt like I was being picked out a little bit. It was making me feel special. It was like there was like a, a connection between us. And because obviously it was in a, what I would call like a spiritual environment, um, mm -hmm. 
it kind of felt like because he was like the the leader or the kind of I don't want to use the word guru but I guess he was kind of like the guru of that group it it sort of um I felt like there was like a, a transmission almost happening like um you know a knowing of like there's something that we need to kind of explore or ex you know yeah there was something more to it than just I'm just making keeping an eye on you and making sure you're okay sure. yeah so you felt that he was establishing a connection between yeah. you yeah okay. and it felt more than just a, a sort of romantic thing in fact it didn't even necessarily feel romantic at that stage it almost felt more spiritual mm. yeah. it's interesting because that activity of the predator the, the hunting where using the stare at that early stage mm. with you it was done in a provocative way it would appear to make you react to it to respond to it to yeah. recognize that it was happening and that in so doing you then reach the view he's trying to establish a connection with me yeah. that the act was you know it, it could have been in another way he could have walked on put his arms around you to establish a connection mm. yeah so he was staring at you to provoke a response from you did you get the impression that he was reading you or was it more or as more as it sounds it was just simply about gaining your attention by staring at you Oh, gosh, I don't know. I've never really thought about it like that. I, I suppose with the benefit of hindsight, I do feel like he was probably reading me, but I wasn't picking that up in the moment. Um, no. I think because, because the situation was very much a place where people were going for active healing um, mm. and a lot of that was about sort of disclosing and getting to grips with your own stuff. Um, a lot of that stuff was kind of quite freely being explored anyway. And so there was a lot of reading going on. I sort of realized later on that, that yeah. what he was very good at was actually getting everybody to really bear their souls and share their deep inner stuff, which he was then mm. able to kind of use like, pretty much against everybody. It was quite ingenious the way he was manipulating everybody in slightly different ways. Um, and I guess he was obviously reading in me that I was responding well to that sort of, I wouldn't use the word flirtation because it was almost too kind of what's the word it was almost too worthy to be flirtatious if you see what I mean like he was quite boundaried around we don't have sexual connections in the circle mm -hmm. and like that although he himself was very much having underhand sexual mm -hmm. connections with people but on the surface yes, yes. it wasn't it wasn't kind of um what's the word it wasn't encouraged and it was mm -hmm. kind of actually shut down and so I didn't feel like it was flirtation as it were but on reflection it was definitely a provocative stare that was inviting a sort of a, a special connection interesting you often find with a narcissist that uh, maintains a sort of laser-like stare at you mm. that's actually being done more for provocation than to read right. you so it's that um intrusive uh, overbearing laser like look into your eyes which sometimes can almost feel a little bit uncomfortable because it's held for too long and the purpose of doing that is not so much as to read you but as to provoke you by mm -hmm. causing you to respond and your response might be to sort of look away slightly bashfully which signals that you're interested and denotes with regard to control but the the act of staring in that way coming from a narcissist is done as an act of provocation where a narcissist is reading you it tends to be more the case that the narcissist is looking you up and down they'll be si essentially sizing you up so yeah. you know it's often said about some women if they're being a bit catty you know she looked me up and down when I entered the room kind of thing but right. a male or female narcissist is more likely to do that to evaluate you to make a determination about what you're wearing how you're presenting yourself to interpret that and is that to do with reading the body language and things like that? Yeah, because that signals more about are you under control? So the laser like stare mm. is designed to get you under control by provoking you. Right. The, the more Ill evaluating look is not so much staring into your eyes, but is staring at you. But you'll notice that the gaze of the narcissist is back and forth across you as they're essentially sizing you up yeah. like a, a lion would be sizing up a morsel that it's going to eat. Mm. Now, what you find by comparison is that with a psychopath, the yeah. psychopath has that stare where 
it combines both the two things that I've just been talking about. Oh. That they have that intense stare because of the hyper focus that the that the psychopath has as staring at you, which will provoke a response. But also, rather than looking you up and down, the psychopath's reading you by staring at your face, by drinking drinking you in in that respect. So there is a difference in that respect as to how those different types of hunters evaluate that victim. Now, as you know, I've written Sitting Target, which went into considerable yeah. detail about how we either consciously or more usually subconsciously evaluate our prey, our victims. And it's uh, excellent reading for people to understand what it is that we're looking for, what it is that you do and what it is that you say that sends those signals to us that are important. Now, you mentioned, of course, quite understandably, Sam, that you didn't feel like you were being hunted at no, the time. At all. But when you look back with the benefit of what you know, do you now see it for a hunt or, or not? Um, yeah, I do. I mean, I suppose what I've kind of realised with hindsight is that, you know, like you talk about the different hunting grounds, there are certain places where there are naturally going to be predatory personalities more than others. Uh, for instance, where there are people that are vulnerable, um, whether that's because they're elderly or because they're young or because they are seeking healing or because they are in that sort of teacher people dynamic or, you know, all kinds of places. Um, and then there are those people that seek those positions of power that mm -hmm. will know it's easier to abuse those positions of power. So, you know, the, the, the places where I found myself, I now realize were just huge hunting grounds. Um, and so I can definitely see that pattern and, and can feel that with the benefit of hindsight. But I, because I had no idea about any of this stuff when I first started, well, when I met this particular individual anyway, I had mm -hmm. no idea that this was even a thing. And so yes. I wasn't aware um, that there were people that would look out and that there were things about me that made me more susceptible to that than others. Because what I've since found very interesting as I've done my research and my recovery is that it seems to be only, as we know, it'll be the empath. I now understand that's the empath, but there are only certain people within those that community that I was in that would have been targeted by the more predatory personalities. And there were plenty who weren't targeted or hunted in that sort of a way. And mm -hmm. so it's pretty difficult for them to then wrap their heads around the fact that, you know, certain people would be more susceptible to it than others. And then, you know, that that can sort of feed into the blaming of you for it happening to you. Mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. So it's, it's, um, something which I'm definitely now very very aware of and which you know in some ways is a blessing and a curse to have that awareness because it can make you kind of suspicious of of, of lots of different situations but it's you know it's essential to have that awareness if you are somebody who attracts and is attracted to the dynamic mm -hmm. absolutely the do you think that you now consciously look to avoid those hunting grounds that you know about yeah, I would say I do. Um, there are certain arenas I would never go into. I, I mean, I've, I've very, rarely done the kind of online dating thing anyway, but I would never mm -hmm. do it now, especially Good. not after listening to all the, the work that you share. Um, mm. I don't really kind of ever engage with people if I'm out sort of clubbing, as it were, or out in those kind of environments. Um, I suppose for me, where I find it more difficult to avoid is when I'm just actively pursuing the things that I'm interested in. Like, um, there's been times in my life when I've been quite interested in activism, for instance, and mm -hmm. I find that those places are real hotbeds of narcissism. Uh, yes. It's not a place where I ever imagined you would find it. So as I continue to live my life, I can recognize that actually there are certain places which I hadn't considered to be that sort of place because you assume that people there are going to be like spiritual communities. The people there are going to be good people. <laughs> Not that I really believe in good and bad like that, but you assume that people are going to have those empathic and compassionate qualities, you know, in activism. But also, and I recognize that activism in particularly is a real hotbed for it because there's all those kind of dominant personalities that want to be the leader. And uh, some of those are very genuine in that in that outlook and, and pursuit. But then obviously there's a lot of narcissists that are attracted to that kind of um, activity also. And so, yeah. I am aware of it, but I'm also, it's kind of annoying. You, you think I don't want to kind of limit myself and have to hide away and not explore the things that interest me because I'm I'm frightened that I might come across lots of narcissists. I think what I'm, I'm learning is like, how do I still show up in life with that awareness that there will be narcissists attracted to me, but also, you know, make sure that I can protect myself from, from becoming ensnared again through my own, you know, inner work or my own awareness, as it were. Absolutely. 
there are so many hunting grounds that we yeah. use and you're right that it's about striking a balance between those places where you think so for example you touched on online dating you don't need online dating in your life you don't no you can, it might be a convenient way of meeting people but as i've explained in my excellent video why you should not do online dating i give all of the reasons not just because of narcissists but other reasons besides why you really ought to never ever go near it ever and so you have an alternative there are other ways to meet people so you don't need to go into that hunting ground if for example you're religious and going to church church is a hunting ground yes <laughs> because they, they have the two essential ingredients power and people who care put those two together and you have a heady brew so that uh, the capability to wield power over people by virtue of triangulating them with an imaginary friend is very powerful so the clergy and even perhaps members of the congregation in formal religion they utilize the fact of this is how you should live your life this is what you should do. And if you don't, you're going to be consigned to a lake of fire. Uh, or if you do this, you're going to get eternal bliss in heaven. So that wields a form of power. So that naturally is attractive for a narcissist. But yeah. also, it includes lots of people who are genuine and empathic because they see following a religion as a way of conducting yourself in a commendable fashion and that it's right to have that kind of moral order to your life so you have the two you see politics as i've explained many times is a, is a marvelous hunting ground for the narcissist to get to the prime aims namely laying your hands on political power then enables you to control millions of people then there's all the fuel that comes from that and you have access to character traits and residual benefits and certainly of course there will be people in your proximity when you're in that political environment that you will interface with but it's actually a means of getting your hands on that power per se which then allows the pursuit of the prime aims more widely rather than necessarily always getting the prime aims within that environment yes it's, it's yeah. a little bit like you're going on a quest and at the end of your quest that's what you get enables you to wield tremendous control over millions of people mm -hmm. and in the meantime you've asserted control over a much smaller number but in a political environment you do have some genuine people and you do have some empathic people who clearly do care but they're not that numerous and they so, wouldn't survive i guess because no it's so it's you not it's it's certainly an area where there's lots of narcissists yeah. because it enables them to get to something which assists them more widely. But in terms of actual proximate victims, there aren't as many as there would be, say, in a hospital or yeah. at a church, because there again, you have the combination of in a environment, in a, in a hospital, you do have quite a lot of empathic people there working, mm. primarily some doctors, but often more amongst the nursing staff that are empathic, they care. You also have volunteers who come along, many of whom are genuinely empathic. You have family members of the people who are unwell, who genuinely care. And then, of course, you've got the wielding of power. Because again, I have the power of life and death over this individual. I have the power to heal. So again, a heady brew in terms of a hunting ground. Yeah. So what you have is you have some hunting grounds which are just festooned with narcissists and not as many empaths. But if you walk in there as an empath, it's, it's a little bit like a scene from Alien where you're just going to walk into the room and there's all of these face huggers going to jump on you. Yeah. And then... There are other environments where you might not have as many narcissists, but they've got lots and lots of targets that they can go after because mm -hmm. there's lots of uh, empathic people there. And then it draws even more, uh, more narcissists. So yeah. in terms of what we have by way of our hunting grounds, there are some which attend to what we need. If, if you like outside of the hunting ground, so going back to politics, naturally it allows people to wield power, say in Whitehall, 
But when you've got your hands on the reins of power in the United Kingdom, your power is then broadcast across the entire country. So if you're prime minister, there you are. If you're a minister, it, it's across the country, not just in Whitehall. Whereas with other environments, you are just asserting your control. So if you are a, a consultant within a hospital, your power isn't really that much outside of the hospital. Sure, people would be impressed by the fact that you're a consultant, etc. But largely, you're wielding your power in that environment. So it's important to notice the distinctions that exist as well in yeah. terms of the environments that, that we favour because of who's in there and the way that the power that we obtain from that environment aids the pursuit of the prime aims. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I'm sort of really thinking while you're talking about particularly the clergy stuff, um, are you aware of the Ben Field case that was recently made into a drama called The Sixth Commandment? And it's come across my bowers because I did do a piece about a man whose name escapes me, who was an unholy narcissist. And I did two or three uh, bits on him. Is he the one who was targeting the old elderly people and getting them to change their wills and he was seduced yeah. having affairs with them? Well, the piece that I did drew comparisons to the Ben Field case right. and mentioned the okay. Sixth Commandment. And I've had a couple of, uh, I've had some viewers write to me about saying, HG, yes. if you watch the Sixth Commandment, I think there's a narcissist in there. Would you analyse that Definitely. individual? So. I mean, he's extraordinary. Um, there was originally a documentary about him about three or four years ago called Catching a Killer on Channel 4, which I watched at the time because my sister was like, Sam, you've got to watch this as a full-blown narcissist psychopath in this in this thing. And it's absolutely fascinating. And the way he hunted and the way he he pursued and, and targeted these very vulnerable elderly people. And, 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 and what that really sort of highlights for me is that there are, it's not just being in the hunting ground that makes you susceptible to it. It's there's other vulnerabilities that go along with it, like, you know, grief, loss, loneliness. Like when you are in a vulnerable state yourself, as well as having the empathic traits, there's mm -hmm. also added, added extra things on it, which also I, I would imagine, and I'm sure you can expand more on this, that make you more vulnerable. Like, for instance, if you're in a state of overwhelm, if you're in a state of grief, if you have just come out of a relationship, or, you know, you've lost a child or whatever it is, these things can add that extra layer in that makes you even more vulnerable to being targeted and exploited by a narcissist. You're absolutely right. You you have, if you like, inherent traits, you're, the fact that you're an empath, which means you have an addiction to the narcissist. Yeah. But you, can, but you also have situational vulnerabilities which yeah. we are able to exploit mm. so a, an example is if one was combing social media and you can see that somebody's celebrating the fact that they've just recently been divorced oh. then that's a relationship that has gone wrong and in many divorces there's a narcissist not all because there are some circumstances where the relationship falls apart because well it just does and I've given examples of in the past about how that can be where there's not two non-narcissists, but often, and it, it follows as a matter of logic, that because a, not, uh, because a relationship is broken down, something has gone wrong. And invariably, for something to have gone wrong so fundamentally, there's a flawed individual in the relationship, and that invariably is a narcissist. So where you've got somebody who perhaps has been declaring the fact that they've recently been divorced, of course, that could be the narcissist uh, heralding the fact that they're now single and ready to mingle, as they often <laughs> declare. But, it's, but if you look at other factors, say, on that person's social media feed, yeah. and it's determined that there is an empath and they're a recently divorced empath, that signals significant prey not only do they have the inherent traits that makes them prey but they have the situational ones namely they've now come out of a divorce which will probably be rather bruising and likely they, they won't have any concept of emotional thinking and will probably fall prey to well the best thing for me to get over that person is to get under somebody new yeah. I'm, re I'm ready now to find a new relationship when in actual fact as we both know from my work they're not no but they think that they are so that signals to one such as i not only are you fresh meat because there you are putting yourself on the market and you want to find a relationship you've already been tenderized by a narcissist 
you've already been beaten up and chewed and all the rest of it and been through the mill not only in your relationship but you've been through the mill in the in the divorce proceedings themselves which means that a supposedly sympathetic and compassionate approach will pay dividends and a narcissist may will likely mirror oh i yes and, and often of course the narcissist because of their own behaviors has been through a difficult divorce themselves and an unaware narcissist thinks yeah. that they're the victim and they'll they'll use that experience to mirror the new victim oh yes yeah i see oh you got divorced recently oh, awful isn't it i went through myself oh she was an absolute nutcase etc yeah. and one. so i i fully understand what you've been through so yeah. it signals a real opportunity to go diving in there. It's similar as well, where you take note of people who engage in this sort of happily heavenly birthday, dad, and it's a year since you've gone, dad, and oh, I miss yeah. you. Again, that, that that's a laser light being sent to a narcissist to say, come and have a go because the virtue of and again you, you have to look for the other things that signal that you're dealing with an empath because a narcissist might engage in that behavior as part of attention seeking of course but if you determine through other things that this person is is an empath or likely to be one the fact they are lamenting the loss of somebody even though it was a year ago or five years ago the anniversary presents an opportunity whereby they're situationally vulnerable and therefore uh, increases their ripeness as prey for a narcissist to think I will go in with the oh yes it's you know oddly enough it's a year since my wife died it's bullshit it's being made up it doesn't matter though kindred spirits link formed mirroring or I've, that's awful that uh, you know that's happened you evidently thought very highly of them showing false compassion so yeah. they are beacons which will attract yeah. us to our prey and that's why people have to should be very guarded about what they share. Absolutely. I mean, this is something that I really realized kind of the hard way is that, you know, we are not just targeted through our, you know, through our virtues, as it were, but we're really targeted through our vulnerabilities. And, you know, a narcissist will often turn up as like the savior of your wound or your dilemma or whatever it is. And, and that's just, you know, especially that kind of the helpful, the helpfulness that can kind of show up to really sort of, that's why I, I'm so careful now of putting myself in situations of overwhelm or things like that, because when I'm in that place of lack or need, it's very easy easy for someone to just come in and save the day as it were and offer me all this help and oh I'll help you and I'll help you do this and I'll help you do that and actually I, I'm so kind of I'm, I'm very wary of that kind of thing now whereas I never used to be I used to just mm -hmm. you know, accept it all and, and and sort of trust it all and having that blind trust and faith and that naivety that I used to hold I just I don't have it anymore and in some ways it can make me a bit hard and a bit suspicious but at the same time it's like I'm just not going to take that risk anymore because yeah that's a way that someone can really get in and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you've got to be so careful what you share. Absolutely. And there are some certain, some instances where we might even double down on that, where there's somebody who is uh, grieving, in effect, the loss of a relationship, mm -hmm. the way that they've been badly treated. And, and you gain one can detect that they're empathic, but they share all of this information online about their trials and tribulations, what they've mm -hmm. experienced, possibly in some kind of forum as well. Yeah. And in such circumstances, it can be engineered to have a lieutenant then approach them and appear to uh, be favorable and start to sort of engage with them, only yeah. then to ghost them, to then disappear. So that pours salt into the wound, which then provides the narcissist with an opportunity <laughs> to swoop in. So the person's already down, a lieutenant is sent in to basically kick them a couple of times whilst they're down to make sure that they are really susceptible. And then the narcissist moves in and expresses the sympathy. That person is almost, there is, they really are that sitting target because oh. they become so vulnerable that they've lost a relationship, upset about it. Then they thought there was somebody who'd come to save them. It's a little bit like those circumstances where uh, it's infrequent or rather very rare where you read about somebody who was sexually assaulted or raped and they went to somebody for help only for them to then take advantage of them also. I've experienced that. Okay. I have experienced that after the initial narcissist that I first have, I was then sexually assaulted by this person who stood up for me in that community a year later. Yep. That is exactly yep. what happened to me. So I relate to that wholeheartedly. And it's, yep. um, yeah. So that the prey stands out. And because, of course, there is that complete absence of emotional empathy, that callousness and 
no sense of remorse or conscience that the narcissist in one moment can be savior and then takes advantage of the fact that you're entirely vulnerable and that you've opened up for this person whether it's emotionally or even saying thank you for thank you for walking me home and seeing that i'm all right uh, would you like to come in and then they take advantage of that situation because they've got somebody that is vulnerable and also either consciously or subconsciously the narcissist knows this person can open opens up to that type of behavior that they aren't guarded enough that they are somebody that wears their heart on their sleeve. They're somebody that believes in the inherent good of people and believes that everybody has got some goodness, where, of course, as I've explained in the past, that isn't the case. Well, so I that kind of... The hard that, way. Yeah, so that kind of prey uh, stands out. Um, and, from, and a narcissist will invariably see that person as asking to be abused. Now, nobody does. Yeah. But a narcissist will see that person. That's where the blame shifting also comes in, in terms of she was asking for it. Uh, it quite simply is you have presented yourself in front of me. And subconsciously, the approach is this is what I do. This, 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 is, this is how I behave. And if you're stupid enough to put yourself in front of one such as I, don't be surprised that this is the outcome. Yeah. And it's, 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 you know, it's horrific, really. It's devastating. But what it's kind of pointing you back to, well, what it pointed me back to was like, just like, you know, I, I, I will not put myself in those vulnerable situations ever again. And, you know, really taking note of that thing of, you know, after you have been in a situation like this, and you have been damaged and traumatized, and you're, you know, definitely not to get involved or, you know, invite people in closely into that, into your world until you've done the healing and you've, you've gone no contact with that person for at least a year. Like I, I won't engage now in relationships or even getting close to men in particular, whilst I'm coming off the back of a, of a because that's how I've ended up getting involved in a, in a cycle of a few little narcissists on the trot was because I didn't mm -hmm. allow myself that breathing space of a, of a year of no contact before engaging in a, in a relationship romantic dynamic again, and just kept getting trapped again. And well, not that many times, but you know, enough times for me to really go, that's it. I'm never doing that ever, ever, ever again. Um, G you know. Given that, and it, that does happen to numerous people, so it's hardly unique for you, Sam. Yeah. Given the fact that you got caught again in the game, do you regard yourself as always potential prey to a narcissist, or do you think that's changed? Um. So I wouldn't like to use the word prey about myself, um, but I do think that I do definitely attract those personality types towards me. I'm very aware that I do. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've even sort of had people say to me, oh, that's very narcissistic of you to think that you're such an attractive prospect for all narcissists. <laughs> I'm like, it's, you know, but the thing is, you have to, you know, yeah, OK, you could look at it like that. But I'm just being realistic. It's like mm -hmm. I have to attract it towards me. And as I've woken up about it, I know it's not just when I've been aware of it. It's actually a lot through my life. And it's not even just romantic connections that are attracted there's also friendships and things like that you you just start to really figure it out and go actually this is around me a lot so I do have obviously the inherent traits that are attractive to narcissists and, and psychopaths so I have to be honest with myself about those things but what I'm I'm really conscious of now is going okay I've got the attraction towards them they've got the attraction towards me what can I do within my own self to make sure that I don't fall susceptible to these dynamics anymore. And it's mostly about doing my due diligence. It's like going, I'm not going to allow somebody into my, certainly into my physical intimate space now until I've known them for, well, I mean, you can know someone for a long time and still not know that they're like that until you really let them in. But I'm just much, much more careful about going, what is it that I am looking for in a human being? How can I, you know, do they have empathy? You know, do my due diligence, check them out, you know, ask the difficult questions, get to know them so much better before I allow them in, in any kind of meaningful way. I think you can probably still get caught, especially by more sophisticated, higher, as you would call them, higher echelon narcissists. Mm -hmm. I know you'll probably still be susceptible to that. And I, I have been, I've been sucked in quite recently, but I can recognize the signs a lot more quickly and I can get out a lot more quickly and I know how to protect myself when I get out, which is doing no contact properly, you know, not just cutting them off, but, you know, deleting them, blocking yes. them, making sure I'm not thinking about them or talking about them or anything. And those are the those are the kind of extra bits on top that make you more 
and um, what's what that help that help you get over it quicker and help you bounce back quicker and help you um you know make sure that you you don't keep repeating the patterns he's going to repeat the patterns a little bit but you just get better at bouncing back being more resilient recognizing it and not taking it so personally because i've realized it's it, it isn't even personal mm -hmm. that's right all people are prey to us yeah you that lady over there him them everybody's prey because another human being is there to be controlled can yeah. provide fuel can provide carriage traits and residual benefits and so as you know I, I have my classification system the starting point being narcissist narcissistic empath or normal and all four categorizations are prey to us so another narcissist is because another narcissist can provide fuel another narcissist can be controlled it may be more difficult compared to an empath but it's nevertheless and so everybody to us is viewed as prey yeah. for the most part it's subconscious so the narcissist doesn't go wandering around in tesco thinking prey by the frozen chicken section prey there over by the pizzas prey <laughs> over by baked goods doesn't think in such terms no. but one such as i does think in such terms that all of those objects those appliances that are walking around are all there for, are all there for the taking so can i ask you a question can, when you are essentially hunting, mm -hmm. can you identify by looking at somebody or by being in close proximity to somebody, whether they are like a good source of fuel? Can you literally feel, well, maybe, I don't know. How how, how do you know who, who, is, who is a good source of the prime aims and who isn't? Like, mm -hmm. In terms of the hunting, there are two aspects to it. The first is a conscious appraisal of certain things that that person okay. is doing, what they're wearing, how they're moving, what they're saying. So I consciously look and determine that from them. And I've set out that in sitting target, the way that there is that conscious appraisal. In other instances, it's an assimilation of information about a person that gives me in effect, an intuitive response as to that they will make a good victim. Okay. And it's, it's <clears throat> what it's like, it's, imagine if you were able to slow down time, okay? So in the space of a second or a few seconds, I'm able to evaluate this person they're naturally prey because everybody is, but they, they are better prey. OK, there's better prospects with this one. And I'm able to work that out in, 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 a, in a number of seconds. But if you were able to slow down that time within, say, that 10, 15 second period of time. It's like my mind has raced and evaluated so many things about them, but has done it in just 10 to 15 seconds. So if you imagine you it's it's uh, you're watching a film and you're seeing me and I enter a bar and I see a lady and ordinarily it, it would be the I'm looking at her as she's at the bar all of a sudden the film slows down to demonstrate that we've gone into uh, into slow motion mode mm -hmm. but within that slow motion mode all of a sudden this information is whizzing up on the screen about her zoom, 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 all these different facts and aspects of her okay. and it's as if I've had several minutes to work this out about her, but because of the way that my brain works and the way that I've been attuned as a predator, I'm able to glean all of this in a very short space of time okay. to evaluate. So for instance, I can't remember who it was, but there was a, uh, a psychopathic serial killer talked about how he could tell from somebody's gait. Mm. Where they walk. Yeah. That, that, that whether that that person would be a victim and there was a study done which evaluated the ability of individuals to pick out people that would make victims basically from mm. the way that they move the way that they talk the way that they conducted themselves right. and so we have this innate ability to pick up on those things which tell us victim wow it's incredible or, or, or perhaps a, a more readily available one Okay. Um, it's it, it, it's similar in the way that uh, a lion that's hunting, obviously, 
looks for this the straddler because that tells them that that one's going to be easier to pick off but they'll pick up certain other things about them as well in terms of the way that they're moving in um who are they near to do they do they sense and see that there's other animals looking out for that one and so forth so it's similar that where uh, that one's able to assimilate a lot of information in a very short space of time um it's a little bit like I think have you ever seen the film with Bruce Willis and um, he and uh, Samuel L. Jackson? I think there's, there's, there's this trilogy. It's Glass and no, I haven't. Well, basically, um, Bruce Willis's character is able to suddenly work out where to find somebody who's been kidnapped, and it's like it's almost like the thought's been planted in his head. But wow. later on, later on what happens is he's subconsciously interpreting information that he's seeing and hearing without without consciously processing it. So for example, he notices a particular color of mud on somebody's trousers, which he then subconsciously picks up on, which gives him an idea of where in the city this person might be. And then he picks up on another detail and he's doing all of this subconsciously, which makes it seem like he's almost telepathically working out where this person is but he isn't. It's sort of similar to that. Okay. That it, see, that it seems to people as if you just know, mm. but we're at, there is actually a process behind it, both in terms of consciously seeing certain things yeah. and having this innate ability to pick up on certain signals that wow. prey gives away to us that tells us, yeah, that person's going to make an easier target. That's very interesting because um, um, have you ever come across the book by Sandra L. Brown called Women Who Love Psychopaths? Have you come across? I haven't, but uh, I'm, oh, wow. I must look into that. Tell me a bit about that. Okay, so Sandra L. Brown is um, she's quite an amazing woman, and she wrote a book. I think it was probably around 2006 back then, and she'd been mm. working um, in with narcissists and psychopaths for about 20 years she'd been working with them but once she then she then started to wanted to understand them through the lens of their victims and so mm. she then started working with the in this case it was men and, and women so I'm making this gender distinction so it was psychopathic narcissistic men and the victims that were female um mm. so obviously it's quite gender specific but through the lens of looking at well first of all the th first thing that she found was that some of the men that she was working with would say exactly what you were just saying I know exactly who to target i can walk into a room and i'll know exactly which women will be the ones that i would go for and the rest of them i wouldn't you know i know exactly who to target just through this mm -hmm. kind of almost like this sixth sense as it yes. were but then she started to kind of analyze and look at the the them through the lens of the women but then she became more interested in analyzing the victims and the women and she was saying there's a, obviously a very specific set of traits that go along with narcissism and psychopathy. But what mm. she started to uncover was that there was also a very consistent set of traits and behaviours that went along with the women that yes. would be in, in, on the other side of this dynamic. So obviously you identify them um, quite clearly in your book, Sitting Target, and in a lot of the stuff that you do through the different empathic um, schools and cadres. Yes. Uh, she's looking at it from a slightly different lens but I mean it's a fantastically interesting book mm. and she identifies certain traits and characteristics that are very consistent between the women that end up um, you know more with the psychopathic sort of um, side of it but it's absolutely fascinating and um, yeah well it's yeah. it's entirely the case that with people that we hunt certain people and you know, going back to the analogy with animals that you're, you're looking for the slow ones, the lame ones, the, the ones mm -hmm. that are perhaps where the parent isn't particularly paying attention to them. Those are your easier targets. And yeah. it's similar with human beings. There are certain individuals. So at the base level, empaths are picked because of the nature of the empath makes them easier to ensnare and keep ensnared. Yeah. So that's why we hunt those types of individuals. Mm -hmm. one, can, one can ensnare a normal and a narcissistic and a narcissist but it can be more difficult there's a greater uh, utilization of asset and resource and it's a little bit like nazi germany invading norway you've got more panzer heads of panzer division per head of population to keep the population subjugated so our narcissism wants the easiest ride that it can get so why pick a target that's not only difficult to draw in but is difficult to keep hold of just mm -hmm. go and find one that, is, that isn't. And 
those individuals have a susceptibility to being ensnared, as we touched on earlier, Sam. Yeah. And the fact is, I, I make mention of in special in, in um, sitting target with regard to the special traits. That there are mm-hmm. certain things about certain people that make them far more susceptible as prey to us. Yeah. And therefore, those are the ones that we go after. Yeah. One of the things that I found quite interesting, I've been sort of revisiting this book in prep for our conversation today. Um, some of the things that are um, the traits of, you know, narcissists and psychopaths, some of the women have a, a sort of a mirrored a mirrored sort of similarity, even though it's coming from, as I say, it's a different driver that that sort of causes them to have that trait. But there are the one that I found the most interesting and one that I can certainly relate to within myself is high thrill seeking, like uh, um, mm-hmm. an attraction towards excitement and um, not wanting to be bored. And so kind of, you know, looking for dynamic and interesting and exciting, adventurous sort of situations. And that is a trait that a lot of the women she consistently found. This this study looked at 75 different women who'd been in these dynamics. So obviously, it's only a, a slice of life and mm. it's women specifically, but they were uh, very attracted to the sort of thrill seeking, excitement seeking. And when I'm hearing you talking about your psychopathy and the, you know, the alleviation of the boredom and the mm. thrill seeking side of it, I was just quite, um, I was kind of shocked by that really. I didn't I hadn't anticipated that that would be a mirrored dynamic within the the, the do other Do you think side. do you think in amongst her uh women group do yeah. you think that she might have actually included unwittingly some narcissists and psychopaths in there? I don't know. She could have done. I need mm. to go and have a look at it, but that's very possible, yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's not to say that if you if you're a thrill seeker that automatically makes you a narcissist or a psychopath. It no. doesn't. But one wonders that within that group, there might have been actually some people who were uh, the mirror, the exact mirror of what she, yeah, what she was thinking. So uh, it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting to see. Um, but certainly, yeah, they will have those traits. So when you've got somebody that presents as dynamic uh, and is a combination, as I've explained before, where individuals through their emotional thinking they think that normal is boring. Yes, and no. they're led to think that the the narcissist is, is exciting, and as you yeah. know from the discussions that we've had uh, separate to uh, this discussion, uh, how I encourage people to look at the narcissist and realise it's nowhere near as fun or as exciting or as thrilling as you thought it was, yeah. and you always have to do that because too often people go, yeah, but you know they are exciting, they are fun, and I explained to you, no, it's not for all the or for a variety of well, it, reasons why that starts, would be it starts off like that but obviously that's not the reality in the long term but i think something that really kind of sets us up for that or programs us for that is that we've been brought up in a household or an environment where there's been a lot of drama and a lot of you know that's just the patterning that we've received and so that feels like that's what love is and that feels like that's what life should be like and we mm-hmm. kind of almost have like a, a peptide addiction to the feelings of adrenaline and cortisol and those things and we mistake that for love and attachment and bonding when really it's just like the chemical situation that we're used to and so right. we're not experiencing those high levels of drama and chaos and the ups and the downs it is boring or it feels it's not boring but it feels boring well, that's the, and that's the it's boring. That's always a significant marker. And yeah. I repeatedly tell people you're going by a feeling rather yeah. than using intellectual logic. So yeah. it feels exciting, but when you actually analyze it, you realize it, it actually isn't. You're just being duped. It's it's almost like that you're being given a placebo that causes you to think this is what you're experiencing. And when you look at it in the cold light of day, it it isn't. No, but your feelings get your feelings get uh, are conditioned to respond in, in that way. You end up chasing the storm that is narcissism in your adulthood because that's all you've experienced as a child. And also, as well, I made this point, and this is to our advantage when we're hunting people, is particularly in the field of romantic ensnarements, which come up more than any other, mm-hmm. and generally speaking, are seen as causing more damage than any other. Yeah. we create the narrative of what love is the notion of romantic love has been created by our kind because that's what we think it is and because we get into these positions of influence and dissemination namely playwrights songwriters yeah. authors film directors hallmark card creators 
whatever it might be. Memes. <laughs> now we've got memes. <laughs> memes, exactly. Oh. That, that, again, not all, but many of those creators are narcissists. Yeah. So the narcissist view of what love is, is shaped. And so it bleeds into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So, so many people then associate a dozen red roses being read poetry to from beneath the balcony in the pouring rain to, you know, proclamations of I crawl over broken glass for you, etc. As Oh, isn't that romantic? Yeah. Well, it is. It is romantic. But here and there, used judiciously, there isn't a problem. But what's actually happening is those are not actual manifestations of love at all. And what's, what's occurring is it's the narcissistic perspective of love, which creates the narrative and the backdrop for what non-narcissists then think is love. Yeah. And so it makes it easier for those prey, particularly those that have that love devotee trait that's susceptible, where they are told this is what love is. And so when somebody comes along and behaves in that way, oh, they must really love me, rather than thinking... Actually, it's all window dressing this, isn't it? Where's the actual substance in it? Yeah, he sends me these gifts, but all he's doing is making, a, going online to Tiffany's and wielding his platinum Amex. Yeah. There's no real thought gone into it. He's even got somebody else to deliver it. You know, wh where's him looking after me for days on end? You know, as, as my, you know, as I suffer some kind of prolapse and he's there looking after me. No isn't found then where's his patience where's his listening to me where's the respect for my ideals and so forth all of that takes uh, perseverance and effort yeah. and emotional empathy and all of that's absent so instead we're able to con victims are conditioned by this notion of what love is and for many people not all but for many people their concept of love has been shaped by narcissists and they don't realize it yeah and that's why it's so important for us to do our due diligence and get very clear, like, well, what actually is a relationship and what should it be like? And what is it that we are looking for in somebody and get very clear about who we are and, and how we're showing up and, and, and what we are looking for in another person before we start getting involved? Because yep. that's how and it becomes even more difficult for the victims in terms of this conditioning, because what happens is you then get people coming along giving you dating advice <laughs> and they write a book because. Yeah invariably an empathic person doesn't feel the need to be prescriptive about the way that other people should lead their lives because oh, they inherently right. recognize boundaries and they keep the, keep their nose to themselves for the most part. But who is it who wants to tell other people what they should be doing? Who is it who wants to garner responses? Who is it who thinks that they know it all? Narcissists. Yeah. So what you do is you get stupid books like The Rules created by a pair of narcissists that tells women this is this is how it should be when you're yeah. dealing with men. And so you get nonsense such as, you know, you should expect a telephone call from him, you know, the next day. If he hasn't messaged you the following day, he's not interested. No, it might actually be the case that that man, and it, quite properly, has an, an existing life which doesn't involve you, and he's only just met you. And therefore, he doesn't need to keep bombarding you with messages. And the fact that he doesn't doesn't mean he's not interested. It actually shows that he's recognizing boundaries and that he's showing emotional empathy for you. So I was only speaking to somebody the other day to explain this concept to them uh, in the context of a consultation where I was saying if you meet somebody and perhaps you've met in a circle of friends and you spend an evening chatting to this person and towards the end of the evening, he said, oh, I really enjoy talking to you. I wonder if I might take you out for dinner. Um, I'm not around next weekend, but if you're available, can we go out the weekend after that? And that lady goes, yes, I'd love to. She says, okay, I'll swap numbers. He said, I'll get in touch with you a few days beforehand to make arrangements for where we go. Okay, okay, look forward to it. Now, he, true to his word, showing accountability and responsibility, yeah. doesn't, doesn't, doesn't start bombarding her with text messages the following day. You're so beautiful. You're my soulmate. You know? <laughs> I, I've never met anybody like you. You know, my breath was taken away. She doesn't hear anything. The silence. And that victim may well be conditioned to think, oh, I've not heard from him. He mustn't be interested in me. So that then when he does get in touch, she's perhaps cooled a bit on him. And she's like, no, I'm not really that bothered now. Where in actual fact, what she should be thinking is, he has got a job, you know, depending on his age, he might have children to look after. Uh, 
you know, he's a single dad. Uh, he has f other friends. He goes and plays badminton. He does his running. He likes watching the films. So he's got an entire life that was in place that he's not dropped just for this yeah. one person. He, show he shows accountability to those relationships. Yeah. And then he gets in touch the Wednesday before saying, really enjoy talking to you. Are you still okay to go out this Saturday? I don't know, ordinarily, I'd be, yeah, we'd love to. Great. Well, this is a New Mexican opened. Um, do you like Mexican food? I do. Right. Okay. How It's called Dutch and Dutch on this address. I'll meet you there at, say, 7.30. Does that suit you? Yeah, we will do. And then on the afternoon, he just checks at five o'clock, just making sure you're still okay for tonight. Yep. Looking forward to it. Great. See you then. Yeah. No pestering, no repeated proclamations. But that victim, in many instances, has been conditioned to think, well, I've not heard from him, so he's not interested in me, when in actual fact... There is an individual which showing all the signs of being a decent relationship. Yeah. Because yeah. he's not going hell for leather to draw you in. He's not asserting control over you. He's not drawing fuel from you. He's respecting the boundaries. He's yeah. showing accountability. He's done what he said he would do. And little by little, your worlds, your worlds don't collide. Your worlds, like two planets, slowly come together. Yes. And that's, that's the where a healthy relationship comes from. Yeah. But so many people, because of the conditioning that goes on in terms of what romantic love is, and also because the society that's been created today is all about now, it, all about now. Yeah. People think, well, if I've not heard from somebody, they're not, they're not interested in me because I want my pizza now. I want my McDonald's now. I want my delivery of my Amazon parcel now. I want to be able to watch something now. I don't want to wait for next week until the next episode drops. I want it now, now, now. I want the relationship now. Yeah. And so that backdrop, along with the conditioning of what romantic love is created by narcissists, mm. conditions victims to not see that there's anything wrong when somebody does come along and immediately within six hours of meeting you start saying oh i want to have kids with you and they're just like, oh isn't that exciting isn't that thrilling he's so into me it's crazy i mean this is something that i really 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 kind of back off from now if anybody shows any signs of pestering me on texts or you know I've, i sometimes have people approach me through my social media and occasionally i will kind of connect and if, if we've got a similar interest or a, you know a similar connection and i recently sort of started to chat with somebody and within a very short space of time, like their messages just became so intrusive and so frequent. I mean, I just completely stopped engaging with them. At one point, they sent me a really passive aggressive <laughs> reel that they'd made to like the wider world about how to uh, respond to people who disrespect you. And I was like, yeah. I know that's aimed at me. And he's kind yeah. of trying to make out that I'm disrespecting him because I haven't answered his text message for two, from two days ago. And it's like, jog on mate do you know what I mean exactly. like, I'm, I'm not going to fall that bollocks anymore um and it's just an immediate red flag so I stopped engaging yes. but it's so easy to just get sucked into this stuff but you know once you know you just you just you don't get fooled by that bollocks anymore because it's just it and it's also it really starts to put you off I mean like if anyone shows that much kind of it's like you're saying they haven't got life it's like where's your life I don't want to be with mm -hmm. someone that is going to make me the whole focus of their world because it's too much responsibility and it's just a huge red flag and yeah mm -hmm. but you're happen. now able to see all of this and say all of this yeah everything that you've just said there has come from a logical perspective yeah this person ha mustn't, mustn't have any life if they wanted to immediately spend all of their time with me yeah. um they're pestering me they're bombarding me that you know that doesn't seem right to me whereas of course once upon a time before you I knew all of this <laughs> yeah exactly and afflicted by I'm your really emotional thinking <laughs> you'd have thought he's really into me yeah. i met this really nice guy and yeah he's so into me and I, oh gosh i'm excited to spend time with him he's wanted to spend lots of time with me this is fantastic why would i not want to spend loads of time with someone as marvelous and as fun and interesting as this person well the reason is is that invariably a person who wants that so early on as you now know, <laughs> it's a fabrication. Yes. And also they obviously need something from you, which is essentially your fuel. So exactly. Well, the point of monopolizing your time is to control you and to drink up all of that delicious fuel and to bring you under control more generally. But the world itself conditions our victims to mm -hmm. fall into that because the world has become a more on demand place. And the yeah. narcissist is on demand. I want that fuel now. Fuel tomorrow is no good to me. Fuel must be now. Yeah. Control must be now. And therefore, a world where everything is geared to the now, rather than saving for it, rather than building it, rather than making it, rather than letting it uh, gestate and, and take time. A world that is increasingly, I want it now, 
in Veruca Salt style <laughs> is absolutely the world that is our playground because it fits entirely with what we want. And what you have is our kind of started to shape the world in that way because that's what we want. We want to make the environment like what we are. Yeah. And then it means that that environment makes it far easier for us to do what we want because it seems like it's normal. And so all of our all of our victims, all of our prey have become increasingly conditioned into a narcissist world. Yeah. And thus it becomes easier and easier to ensnare people because they don't see anything wrong with many of these behaviours because it's become normalised. Yeah. And that whole thing of just, you know, sort of, you know, jumping in. I have so many female friends who will just jump straight into kind of physical intimacy with somebody. And I'm like, and, and I, you know, I'm not not judging that because at times that I've done that when I was younger, you know, mm. I, I really have not thought that through at all. But now that I have the awareness that I do, there is no way I would do that. And I sometimes, you know, it's that difficult balance when, when you know about all of this stuff, you know, you can drive your friends crazy with, you know, with your, with your talking about it and they don't want to hear it, you know, and they like to think, well, it happens to you. It doesn't happen to me. But I see so many of my friends who are consistently having relationships, which, which I can see from the outside look like they are of the narcissistic dynamic, but they don't understand. They don't get it. And they're not interested in learning about it. And it's frustrating, but you just, you know, I guess you just have to let people learn the hard way, but you know, so many people just jump straight in and just get straight on with it. And then wonder why, you know, three months later, they're left devastated and mm -hmm. sad, confused and not really understanding why this person's no longer showing them any attention or interested in them anymore. And with Indeed. a whole trauma trigger uh, triggered as well and it's just that the more we educate the more we talk about it and the more that we do our due diligence and and also address those parts of us which are wounded you know the bits of us that are grieving or that are in loss even for things that have happened years ago you know those parts of us that are seeking that approval or that attention or that validation from things on the outside of us the more we kind of address all that stuff the less impervious we are to to this sort of um predatory behavior <laughs> indeed guess. And on that, there is a predator lurking behind you <laughs> who looks like he or she might be uh, taking down a mouse or two later. Yes, I know. So, my cats, she's right and, here. <laughs> well, we, we, and we all know cats are narcissists. So yeah, they're amazing. They, I mean, like, yes, it's true. Good. It's true. Well, there we are. So thank you, Sam, for a, another excellent discussion about narcissism and uh, empaths and the different perspectives involved. We will, of course, be speaking again in the future. But for today, that concludes Tea with Sam and HG. Thanks, HG. You're welcome. <laughs>